Well, good morning. How's everybody today? Good. All right. Um, I, it's uh, hard for me to consider this as a keynote because actually there are really more opening comments and I have 15 minutes. So, uh, and those of you who've seen me present in the past know I usually have twice as many slides as I have time for. Um, uh, this time I have about 15 slides for 15 minutes, so we'll be we'll be trying to keep you guys on on track and on time. Um, let's see, here we go. So uh, as Rob kind of set the stage perfectly, is what is a complex uh, generic drug product, and to make sure that we're all um, aligned on what it is we're talking about, since you have two days here on the same topic. Um, and then also, why is it worthy of a two-day workshop? Not only why is it worthy of a two-day workshop, but this is the fifth workshop that Rob and his office have conducted in just this fiscal year about complex generic drug products. The fifth. So that's a, uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, I think, a big deal explaining to you why we know and feel that this topic is so important. It's in the Gadufa 2 commitment letter. It's part of the Commissioner's Drug Competition Action Plan, or DCAP. Um, and then, as Rob alluded to a little bit, uh, the work that's been done in ORS, uh, creating the foundations of a robust regulatory research program that basically is the science behind our ability to set standards, meaning guidance for industry to help provide information to you guys about how you can develop these products and such. So here's the definition. It's in the Gadufa 2 commitment letter. Um, it is basically um, what is uh, considered a complex generic drug product is those that are complex mixtures, complex formulations, complex routes of delivery, complex dosage forms, and complex drug device combination injectables. Or, I'm sorry, compact combination products. I even have the link on the bottom for the Gadufa 2 commitment letter. If you are with a company that's participating in generic drug development, generic drug applications, any kind of work in generic drugs, it is imperative that you read the commitment letter and understand what is the agency's agreed commitment along the program. But why are we here? So complex products are used across the board for patients and patient care. Um, they are critical to the care of many medical conditions, serious and maybe not so serious, but serious things like multiple sclerosis, variety of cancers, mental health disorders, and things that are much more common, like diabetes, COPD, and such. Um, but for many patients, these products are very expensive, and it therefore limits access to those, um, to those patients for those important medications. Um, and the markets for these new drug products are huge. We're talking billion-dollar markets with a B, billion-dollar. So I just have a couple of examples on this slide for particular RLD, or reference listed drugs, and what their market share is. Big deal. Big dollars. Um, uh, also, there are complex products that are not huge market share. Some of these have small market capitalization, which means they're a little bit less appealing, a little bit less enticing for generic drug developers. But because of that, there's not generic competition, I mean, there's not products being developed. There's not at submissions coming to us. There's lack of generics. Again, lack of access for patients. That's what, we're, that's what we, FDA, we're here for. It's all about the patients. How do we get high quality, affordable medications in the hands of patients? And these products have a lot of challenges to develop, to regulate, and such. But the focus today, in the next two days, are on the scientific challenges for complex generic drug products. This is just an illustration for you. Um, this comes from a GAO report in 2016, where they looked at drug pricing across a variety of different um, dosage forms over a five-year period. Uh, and they looked at drug prices for both brand name and generic products. The top right-hand corner shows drug in I mean, price increases for topical products during this time frame. 57% of the drugs that GAO looked at had an incredible price increase. And the average price increase for just topical generic drugs, I mean topical products, was 276% higher 
at the end of that five-year period than at the beginning. Thus, again, limiting access to medications for patients. So I've alluded to this already, uh, um, that for some brand drugs, we don't even have an application in-house. We don't have any knowledge that these products are being developed. So we can't approve a generic drug if we don't have applications. Um, we have published a list of off-patent, off-exclusivity drugs that do not have an approved generic. This is, again, part of the commissioner's drug competition action plan. The website is included for that. Uh, and we update that list periodically. We understand that in, in this arena of some complex generic drug products, that there's a little bit of uncertainty to industry and in how they would develop them. Um, I would argue that there's probably a whole lot less uncertainty because of the regulatory um, research program under GDUFA-1, for which there's been a tremendous number of product-specific guidances. Um, and because of the complexity in developing these products, this is also a part of GDUFA-2, is it's um, important that there be more interactions between FDA and industry while industry is developing this. You'll hear much more about this pre-ANDA program later this morning. This is a very simplified list um, of what would be required in a submission in a generic drug application in an ANDA. But what I really want to point out is this part of it, the pharmaceutical equivalents and the bioequivalents. Because under the regulations, a generic must demonstrate sameness to the RLD, or in a more scientific basis, equivalence to the RLD. In addition, it's critical that generic drugs, and this is when we approve a generic drug, we are making this claim, that the generic has the same clinical efficacy and safety profile, meaning the same therapeutic effect as the brand name when administered to patients under condition, conditions specified in labeling. So that, to me, is a little bit of regulatory speak or regu regulatory gobbledygook, because that really comes out of the regs. But let's put that in some plain language. What does that mean? It means that the generic has no significant differences from the brand. It means that they can be substituted for each other without any adjustment in dose or any additional monitoring or training for the patient. And this substitution occurs at the pharmacy level, so without the, um, uh, the physician. We recognize that there are challenges for complex generic drug products. That's why we are at the fifth workshop of complex generic drug products. So for example, how do you demonstrate sameness with respect to the active ingredients? For bioequivalents, um, we understand how to do this for simple, simple products. There's the traditional bioequivalent studies, medication taken, blood samples drawn, um, and determination of CMAX and AUC, statistical calculations, et cetera. But for these complex drug products, that straightforward approach may not be applicable. Um, what we've advocated for historically have been these comparative clinical endpoint studies. We also recognize that those may not be ideal. We have a long history of seeing these types of studies come in. Uh, we know that they are, they are an insensitive indicator for equivalence. They're large studies. They're expensive studies. So you guys from industry complain because of that, and we hear you. Um, and we also see that they are frequently poorly conducted studies. Um, as far as therapeutic equivalence goes, here's some other challenges. What kinds of comparative analyses are needed to ensure or to support substitution? And if there are differences, for example, in the inactive ingredients, which is permissible in a generic, um, if they're different, what, what is allowable with differences in inactive? And do they affect the safety and efficacy profile? So this is kind of a, a one slide um, of what Rob alluded to about where the, the regulatory science has come from. Um, prior to GDUFA, there basically was seed money. There was a couple thousand dollars, a couple of research um, programs um, to, to help understand how to demonstrate sameness. Under GDUFA 1, thankfully, there was a mandatory regulatory science program under that. Uh, in my mind, this is a robust regulatory science program 
it is one of the key reasons for why the generic drug program at the agency has been so successful over the last five years. This has been a rather modest program, though. It funded $100 million worth of research. So for those of you who conduct research, that's not a whole lot of money. And for those of you like buying for NIH grants and such, not a lot of money. Um, so I'm saying, modest program, $100 million, about 100 grants and contracts. But the output of that has been spectacular. There were over 800 product-specific guidances published. But mo what most important about why we're here today are the complex. 40% of those guidances addressed how to develop complex generic drug products and how to demonstrate that sameness or equivalence. And it created the foundational elements for what we're in now, which is GDUFA 2. GDUFA 2 requires us to continue this regulatory science program. It creates certain timelines for when we have to publish product-specific guidances. And it also creates this pre anda program. This regulatory science program has been a huge success. Um, and much of the, um, the accolades for this reside with Rob Leyenberger and every single person who sits in the Office of Research and Standards in OGD. There is, in my mind, this is a spectacular return on investment. $100 million, 100 um, contracts and grants uh, to provide clarity on how to develop over 800 products. That's a pretty big deal. What you're getting out of this is evidence-based, research-based, science-based standard setting. So it's not guidance for the sake of guidance. It's guidance that has incredible scientific foundations underneath it. And you see well-validated methodologies that can be used to demonstrate sameness or equivalence. So these outcomes, um, I'm going to walk through quickly. Information for industry. I already mentioned product-specific guidances. It assists our FDA reviewers and assessors when they're evaluating your application. And you will hear much more about that in the next two days. And it results in approvals. That's really what you're looking for, right? You, you want to you get an ANDA in, and you want to get it approved. So as, as Rob alluded to here, this program is the foundational elements. This is the foundational science. We can resolve these challenges of sameness and equivalence with all of this science that we've done. You know, we, we're, we are confident in how best to characterize complex active ingredients, how to understand and measure critical quality attributes for drug formulations, and, and also how to understand patient use, especially of these complex products that have um, drug devices. Here's just a sampling of some generic drug applications that have been approved in just the last year. I have them broken down by those definitions of complex generic drugs per the DUFA 2. So uh, products approved that have complex API, products that have complex formulation, complex routes of delivery. This is a huge deal for topical products. You can see almost all of them, I think, are topical. And complex drug device combinations. Today and tomorrow, you will hear from our scientists and our um, reviewers about these um, different approaches um, to best understand, for example, physical chemical sameness. You'll hear a lot about the in vitro testing or Q3 methodologies. You'll hear about improved study designs, largely as a result of a better understanding of drug product performance. You'll hear more about modernized statistical approaches for equivalence. And you'll hear about some uh, clinical pharmacology tools, namely modeling and simulation. So our um, Office of Generic Drugs and Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Scientists, reviewers, regulatory experts will be here. They will explain to you what generic drug developers can learn from our regulatory research studies and this, the results and, and this entire program. They will focus on key scientific issues in order to help you with your applications. Because at the end of the day, if your applications don't get approved, it's more work for us. So what we really want to see is less RTRs. We want to see increased first cycle approvals. And we want to have less cycles to approval. So the purpose of these next two days is to help you, industry, with the applications you're putting together, the research you're doing, that end up in ANDAs. And then you'll also hear about this pre-ANDA program. This, uh, the, the days will be organized around um, these same 
four def or the same definitions of complex generic drug products as you saw earlier in my GADUFA um, two slide. So with that, I finish uh, 20 seconds ahead of time, so I'm, I'm sure that uh, Jeff is happy. Um, I was intending to be here for most of this. I have been called back to the office for, for a couple meetings, but I do intend to come back physically um, and, and see some of the presentations. So I hope that doesn't make anybody from OGD kind of shake over there. I got some thumbs up, so that's OK. So anyhow, um, this, the, the content here is incredible. Um, this is really going to be an excellent uh, workshop, and I, I wish you all the best. Thank you.